Today in lecture 23, we will uh, finish the rest of uh, chapter 14, 15. Uh, in particular, we will uh, repeat the argument about what, under what condition we could achieve homogeneous shear, that is, in, avoid shear bending. Then I will indicate that the shear bending we observe is not uh, something you can explain through the constitutive non-monoticity idea. After that, I, I give you a rather peculiar case where if you can avoid startup and ramp up your shear rate, you could uh, avoid shear bending. And lastly, I'm going to try to review for you all we have learned in terms of the phenomenon described from chapter 6 to chapter 15. Okay, uh, so uh, today my hope is to uh, uh, finish the rest of the subject under uh, chapter 15, and that will probably take half of the class. Then I will move on to give you a, a brief summary of all the phenomenology we have uh, uh, been discussing so far. And this will prepare us or motivate us to go to chapter 16 on the theory. So uh, the theory, of course, uh, uh, is, is the core part. So in other words, I could advertise, say, oh, everyone should just go ahead and look at the, our next lecture on chapter 16 and see where the issues are. And that will pique your interest in looking at all the previous lectures about why we are proposing a different way to look at the picture theoretically. So in any case, uh, I was discussing uh, chapter 15. Uh, the chapter 15 had a title of called uh, Homogeneous Entanglement, where I start to uh, motivate you guys to think about whether such a homogeneous state of entanglement could survive if you start to apply a, a great deal of uh, deformation at a fast rate. So that's, the, that's where we were last time. And uh, uh, I have a habit of not looking at the book as to where, where we are in, in chapter 15. But uh, here I probably should take a look by indicating that, uh, that there are parts I'm going to skip. In other words, you can read it on your own. And there are parts I will go into some detail. So for example, the... Uh, the uh, chapter 15, the first section is called What is Entanglement? I, I said a lot about it last time. Uh, right? For us, it's just some kind of constraint like this. We talked a lot. If you already started to forget, uh, we, have the, we have the recording from last time. So the second topic was the second topic was uh, the second section was when, how, and why a disentanglement can occur. So this is something I, I will ask you to read what I wrote in, in, the, in, in, uh, in the book. It's a very short description. But I have been starting to use this word disentanglement all the time. And we will, of course, go into a great deal of details especially in chapter 16, about how to speak about disentanglement. But just, uh, it's certainly enough to ask when it can occur and how it occurs, and lastly, why it occurs. So this is just some assignment for, for you to read. Let's go to uh, a few parts that I want to indicate. Uh, the third one is, I'm coming back, I'm, I'm, uh, it's almost repetitive. I'm coming back talking about uh, the condition for homogeneous deformation. And in particular, homogeneous shear. So what is the criteria? We, uh, if you look at the book, which I'm going to skip, I, I considered a case of uh, uh, thinking about this in terms of displacement. And and uh, uh, so, for, you know, 
Of course, this displacement took a time of this much to occur. But in the book, I, I entertain the question of if you argue about through the displacement idea, uh, the argument doesn't quite work very well. So this is uh, figure 15.3. So I will skip that, and you can read it if you like. And I will come back to uh, addressing more seriously what, 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 uh, under what condition you can have homogeneous shear. And this, if you recall, is what we have done once before. Okay, just look at the top part of it. So if disentanglement occurs in the sense of one layer undergoing disentanglement, oops, then indeed you can think about that introducing a certain level of internal slip. Keep in mind, remember, I think this is nothing about the fact there is a layer that's being sheared very fast. Let's say internal slip. So I'm not going to into any of this uh, details, but rather than to tell you that uh, since you learned the slip, a disentanglement can occur at the surface, I, uh, I'm persuading you that you can also think that this could occur in the bulk if already you already made some way to prevent wall slip, for example. And in that case, I know I didn't draw very well. In that case, uh, you can also define the extrapolation as B, of course. Of course. And I'm just going to indicate another way to describe the condition for inhomogeneous shear. Obviously, if this is very small, I argue that you will not have any problem. You will have homogeneous shear. Because if this is very small, then that layer of disentanglement will not be communicated to the rest. The rest doesn't know that layer has disentangled. Since the condition is the same for other layers, the other layer will disentangle too. So nobody win the horse race because the horse race is not uh, measurably uh, 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 quantifiable. Uh, so, but you know what is this? V over Vs in this limit is uh, is of course, you can do it uh, 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 very easily, is of course uh, Vs plus gamma dot times H. The gamma dot, of course, is the, 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 uh, is the gamma dot after the correction by the slip, right? It's the actual gamma dot and Vs. And then you know the trivial thing, so you can just divide everywhere by a gamma dot. And that's, by definition, by definition given here, is B. OK? So I can move H up, and then I would have B over H here. Right? And the B carry the meaning I, th I think it's very convincing. I don't need to explain. This B has the same meaning as at the surface. So we know that. So therefore, you know this limit is the same as being, in other words, it's been guaranteed by this. Yeah. Because, you know, in that limit, the bottom is just one. So this conclusion, we made it once before by directly computing for it in chapter 9. Here in chapter 15, I'm repeating it. It can be done just by looking at using the insight you have or the notation, notions from wall slip uh, calculation. So that's it. Uh, we know the condition for, for, uh, for achieving homogeneous shear is this condition. 
This is a repeat now. OK. So we're done with the, with the, with the section 5.3. Let's move to 5.4. Fifteen point four, rather. Uh, this is a, a, a rather serious matter. It's not the first time you heard it, but it's a time I want to connect to the tube model a little more uh, uh, convincingly because I have data here. So this is the issue. I have the title of constitutive non-monotonicity, which I uh, this is for you. For you, should be a repeat. I indicated that uh, uh, that the original two model has this feature, and this is due to chain over orientation. Uh, we have all the recordings, so all the parts are there. You, you can you can go back to uh, this is discussed in chapter. Uh, sorry, did I say chapter? This is in lecture. 19, discussing some detail. Uh, so this is uh, the original, this is a feature from original Doi Edward model. I want to further emphasize that actually, uh, before such a tube model, very detailed tube model, uh, People already Zico. I apologize for, for not writing it right. Uh, uh, I know Johnson is correct. Sigman. It reminds me of, of our uh, polymer scientist uh, in Santa Barbara. But uh, uh, don't quote me on, on, on this name. But in 70, I recall it was 77. So it was several years prior to the tube model, prior to the Dwight Edward model, that there were already discussions of contemplating what would be a scenario where things will become unstable. So they don't care what was the molecular origin. They are just thinking about, hey, if you give me a non-monotonic relationship between shear rate and stress, then, lo and lo behold, lo and behold, you should uh, uh, anticipate shear bending because this part is really unstable. Nothing can exist here. So with that, I'm uh, coming to a discussion very quickly, concretely, about uh, a scenario where you have non-monoticity. As far as I could tell, if you have non-monoticity, what it means is I can apply a rate which is V over H. You know, remember, the rate you apply is always nominal rate. Experimentalists have no control of what you can do inside the sample. Right? You can only apply to the surface. In absence of a shear, uh, uh, in absence of a slip, you can only say, I maintain the lower surface to zero speed and top surface to a certain speed. And V over H, let's say, is this green number. And it's a unphysical point. Well, it means some portion will be sheared with shear rate one, some portion will be sheared with shear rate two. I mean, when I say some portion, some layer. If this is the total H, let me have the notation. Uh, I use a kappa to indicate the fraction. If, if, you, uh, if you have H, then a fraction, let's say kappa H, will be sheared very slowly. And the rest Sorry, I should rephrase it. Uh, the kappa amount will be shared at the rate of uh, gamma 2, fast. And a large part will be shared very slowly. Okay, And then, of course, you can move to a higher nominal rate. 
here, then you will find the fast rate layer will be thicker. So in general, uh, there is the understanding that to accommodate for this nominal rate, the sample will simply adjust in terms of how much of a fraction of the gap will go high shear rate and how much will go at low shear rate. Yeah. So. So it's yeah, it's a fraction, a fraction. So you take h as one, then kappa is of course a percentage. Yeah. So. But it means what? It means if you go ahead and do a particle tracking velocimetric uh, measurement, you should only observe two rates with different, adjusting different height of the, of the two band. And this data just disproves that. In other words, this data for each of the nominal rate, it involves very different uh, gamma one and gamma twos. They don't they don't lock into gamma one, gamma two, and just adjusting the height, the proportions of the different bands. So, so clearly, uh, 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 this is a simple illustration that such a, uh, a, a uh, simple scenario does not appear to be the case. Okay, so that's 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 uh, that's all there is in this this little section. I'm uh, again mentioning it very quickly and very briefly. Um, in fact, for you, if you are experienced, you will ask me a, a, a next question, um, and it only shows the complexity of the problem uh, by it. Um, Maybe that can be even used to criticize what I just stated, which is this. You see, if, uh, let me go to, go to one more slide to show you this. If you claim to have shear bending, okay, then uh, you, you should know, actually, that, that there should be symmetry. In other words, the middle plane should be, some, everything should be symmetric with respect to middle. So if you have bending, okay, your bending should be always something like this. Or you could have the reverse. You follow me? In both cases, it will be symmetric with respect to the middle. Yeah? And of course, nobody, let alone, nobody has a clue whether you should always have scenario one or scenario two. But most of the time, I'm t uh, 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 telling you, most of the time, we don't even have the symmetry. We simply don't have the symmetry. So just, uh, and you may ask why, okay? So in, uh, ideally, it sh you should have the symmetry. In fact, I can uh, uh, briefly indicate the cases where we tend to see some symmetry sometimes is when we had the laws, the large empty oscillatory shear. When you cycle back and forth, eventually the system r uh, realize, gee, there may be uh, some symmetry that you can uh, uh, evolve into. But in general, you don't. And uh, you may say, oh, perhaps that's not very surprised. You may g give a wrong argument. You may say, oh, one uh, surface is zero, the other surface is finite, that breaks the symmetry. No, no. That doesn't break the symmetry, precisely because the middle will see the lower plane moving one way, the upper plane moving the other way. So in the middle, they will see the symmetry. Uh, you may say, oh, I know why. It's because when you do that, you typically uh, wrap a film around it. 
and that could break the symmetry because uh, film is stationary and yet this one is moving and so on and so forth. Uh, the short answer is uh, it's not difficult to break the symmetry. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think breaking the symmetry will violate the idea that the gamma, that, that the system should, uh, lock down to, to rates. I don't think, I don't think that symmetry breaking will violate this, if this is the physics. And as I said, this is not what we observe. So the system doesn't lock on to, lock on to two, or shear rates as you vary the applied rate. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I can say about this. Uh, uh, it's enough uh, bad news already, of course. So let, let me just move on to one of the last topics in chapter uh, 15 before I start to do some review. Uh, the chapter, uh, the 15, uh, the fifth element in, in this uh, chapter is uh, a rather peculiar aspect, which uh, I proposed to uh, my student, Xiang uh, and Puyang all there. Uh, and I think for a moment they probably didn't believe me. And that is this. Suppose now you are applying, we're talking about shear bending, okay? We're talking about shear bending. We're talking about shear bending that typically occurs in this limit. You know, at least the shear rate need to be rather high. Now, uh, I last time clearly remember in the last lecture, uh, uh, asked you to really appreciate what this means, right? In other words, basically, if wi, if wi, oh lord, if wi is 100, it really means taking your sample 100% to the right only takes hundreds of tau. Okay, so you, within tau, you move 100 to the right. And that seems to be very severe. The system should be, uh, should be in trouble in terms of how to respond to it. Of course, this is true because you apply the rate that high, right? So my proposal to my student at that time was, hold on, can we do something different to prove or to probe the nature of why this shear bending occurs? Why don't I uh, allow you to have WI applied, but don't do it like a traditional startup. Do it, uh, you know, look at one figure at a time. Do it like this. In other words, instead of doing startup, which is this one, you gradually increase your speed. And, and use the time arbitrarily long, if you wish. Could be hours. Definitely, I, I don't recall uh, uh, for the moment what this uh, subscript means. Definitely, let this time be much longer than tau. How about that? So you're just going to. It, it, the amazing thing, however, however, uh, uh, there are several parts that really teaches you a little bit. One is equilibrium characteristics. What is the meaning of that? When I say equilibrium characteristic, tau is an equilibrium characteristic. It still guides you. It tells you, man, at this point, I'm in a fully entangled state. If I were to disentangle, disengage, it would take me tau time. Okay? So that's relevant. That's relevant in terms of judging how fast you are sharing it. So if you uh, think about, if you have that in mind, you will ask yourself, at this point, your second way of doing it, right? So you're going to start your velocity very, very slowly until you reach the same velocity. And you can ask, gee, don't you also have this condition at, after this time, right? 
And the short answer is actually no, because, because, because this state may not possess, may not have the, the condition of full entanglement anymore. And that's probably why my student didn't believe me. In other words, uh, the reason you can be confused is to, is to, uh, is to uh, question, gee, at this time, my velocity finally reached a high value. Okay? My, my shear rate finally reached a high value. Is it not much higher than 1 over tau? Well, if you define your tau as equilibrium, of course you have uh, reached the uh, 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 wi that's as high as you define. But during this time, your entanglement state may be involved into a totally different, unrecognizable structure. In fact, the short answer is let's look at what, 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 uh, uh, what this prediction is. So I suggested that if you do this patiently enough, ramping this rate up to the final same speed eventually, you will not see shear bending. Remember today's, uh, or much of chapter 15 is about no shear bending. This is the case. So, instead of uh, having a startup that produces an overshoot, you anticipate that the system will respond very, very gently. At any moment, you are in linear response region. In other words, at any moment, your WI Shall I call it wi prime just to just to uh, 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 remind you we're doing something different is always in the is always in the limit of this at any moment. So if that's the case, of course you have no chance of uh, perturbing the structure, destroying the structure. Rather, you give the system enough time to keep accommodating you, to keep adjusting to what you're doing. So in any case, this is, uh, this is just the uh, proposal. And instead of shear banding, perhaps you will, so this is actually velocity, perhaps you will have homogeneous shear. Okay, so that was the idea. And this is the actual data. So this blue data, of course, is startup shear. The, the, the velocity is right away high, or rather, already speaking in terms of shear rate, is already high. And of course, you're monitoring with uh, a PTV, with a particle track velocimetry. In fact, this velocity, uh, this shear rate is, uh, is uh, uniform in the system. And if you apply it long enough time, you find that, uh, that you have, uh, uh, that you have, uh, 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 I'm just trying to make sure that this uh, data goes together. So there are three group of data. So we looked at the both a solution and a DNA, uh, a DNA uh, solution, as well as a butadiene solution. So let's look at this first butadiene solution case. Uh, uh, Puyang was patiently trying to ramp up, and he took overnight to, well, nearly overnight, many hours, 10,000 seconds. Whereas the second time he was less patient, he used uh, only an hour or two. And uh, the stress response is obvious. I know it's somewhat unfamiliar because it's plotted on double log. Basically, startup gives you overshoot. In other two systems, the system all can respond gradually, avoided overshoot in both fast ramp and, and slow, fast ramp and slow ramp. And uh, the velocity profile is given here. Okay, the rate of what? Oh my goodness, that should be one over. 
the final rate is one. So you can see that uh, this was lowered. You see, uh, yeah, here we are. So the startup here at 500, that's this profile. It's shear bending, of course. The one he did a fast ramp, that red one, is still shear banded. This is after 4,000 seconds because he tried to avoid shear banding. It couldn't. And only the slow ramp at 10,000 seconds, uh, uh, you find the shear rate is all constant. Uh, sorry, you have a basically no shear banding. It's a uniform shear. So the lesson we, uh, we learned here was actually the system is quite eager to shear band. Avoiding shear banding was a challenge. Uh, perhaps not entirely surprising, basically to, to, for the system to, to be aware they are in this condition is, is not so straightforward to achieve. Okay, but basically that's the, that's the story. That the, uh, oh, that's not all the story. The, the implication of this, the meaning of this is very, very profound. What, what does that tell you? That depending on whether you have startup or very gradually reaching the, eventually it's the same boundary condition, eventually. You can either have shear binding or no shear binding. What does that tell you? Or well, I can uh, restate that question. If you really have uh, constitutive non-monotonicity, then shear binding should be guaranteed. Because this is all just about steady state. So, so, so shear bending is not necessarily a permanent property of, of, of your system. It's, it's a transcend response. Of course, it's transcend response. We know that. The mystery is why that transcend response could survive. In other words, once you shear bend, it, given its time, it does not evolve back toward a homogeneous shear state. It does not. And this is just a, a, a intriguing. Uh, because, look, all this supposed to mean is, you see, this one... This, uh, uh, this layer is sheared uh, 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 more slowly than this layer, okay? Uh, so uh, in steady state sense, meaning over long time is that. So you can arbitrarily say that this layer has a viscosity that is much higher than this layer. Period. And then you may say, oh, do, what do we mean by viscosity? Well, it turns out it's still meaningful to say that it represents the state of entanglement, the state of how they wrap onto each other, mingled with each other. One is mingled with each other more tightly than the other. There's without question, because in steady state, uh, uh, you can even go back and start to invoke the idea of G times tau. Tau 2, G2, why not? And we learn in steady state. So this is G1, Tau 1. And we learned in that uh, discussion in chapter, chapter 9, I like to say, meaning when we talk about uh, chapter 9 or chapter 7. When we talk about the learning about, yeah, it's chapter seven, learning about the nature of steady state. Uh, from there, we learn that this uh, entanglement state uh, uh, is uh, 
It's something time dependent. So, so, so uh, the system in, in this layer uh, simply uh, the chains simply being convected much faster. Therefore, they have a much lower uh, relaxation time. In other words, the origin of viscosity ch differences is in the difference in the relaxation time you can assign to them, not in the state of entanglement, because they are all sort of a still experience uncrossability. It's just on what time scale they are experiencing it. So in any case, uh, I think I said enough about it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it is, uh, I, I, I can never uh, truly uh, over appreciate how the different entangled state can, can just coexist. They locked in there without uh, saying, hey, why don't we communicate? The two layers do not communicate in the sense, hey, why don't, we know there is another state we all going to enjoy, enjoy. Why don't we just go to that state? Which is, a, which is it's possible, supposedly. Well, I showed you it's possible. By, by this ramp, I just showed you that it's possible to go to that intermediate, if you like, that has an intermediate viscosity, A to 3. Right? That's in between. Uh, A to uh, 2 is smallest. Why not go there? And it doesn't. In other words, once it gets stuck, they just stay stuck there. And so we uh, not only look at the, the polymer, uh, polybutane solution that way, uh, in one of the uh, DNA uh, samples, uh, one, one was able to do something uh, uh, a little different and also interesting, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, you can do two things. Uh, in fact, one, one is you do a conventional startup, so you have shear bending. That's this one. Okay. Secondly, I, I omitted that. I didn't say too much, but it's covered in the lecture. If you use a rate high enough, you can remove shear bending. Basically, you go to a region where everything must disentangle, quote unquote. Then you can reach your homogeneous shear state. So that's this red. At sufficiently high rate, okay? you will produce a homogeneous state. And the question was, once you produce that homogeneous state, we quench down, we lower the rate back to the rate we use to produce shear bending with startup, and, and demonstrate that homogeneous state is stable or not. So that's how you do it, right? You have an overshoot, you reach sort of steady state, and you quench down to a lower rate, and then, of course, the stress will, will tend to... Uh, uh, Drop, and then it overdropped. In other words, uh, uh, in other words, it 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 is a it is a higher rate of six, where the state of entanglement is less compared to what what a, a, a shear rate of one can tolerate. So, in fact, after the switching, the stress will grow back a little bit because it try to re-entangle a little bit. And in that process, more or less, your profile remain homogeneous, because, as you started with. Okay, and uh, the other one, the the green one, is the traditional, not traditional. It's the same as what we did for the polybutane solution. You uh, basically ramp up the shear rate. That's this green line, solid line, and then this uh, open green line, diamond is the stress response, no overshoot. And in that case, you more or less uh, avoided the sharp shear bending. That's the, the green here. Okay, so, uh, so this is just a second case, learning about how to avoid shear bending, and once you have homogeneous shear, whether you could maintain it. More or less it does so. Okay, that's... Uh, that's... Uh, really is all so far we have about uh, 
the, the, the a variety of, of phenomenology that we have seen. Um, you, you probably can tell some of this phenomenology was really theoretically motivated. Uh, to, in other words, to understand the nature of shear bending. Some of this, right? Like this ramp, ramp experiment, ramp up experiment. Like the, the different shear rate experiment to show it's not locked into two rates. So I think we are reaching a point where we should be ready to talk about uh, how to uh, how to understand the phenomenology. I, I must confess to you that uh, that the majority of the experimental data that we went through so far from through from chapter 6 to chapter 13, 14. Majority of this data were made or discovered after we already understood the theory. In other words, uh, it, it, they are the predictions of our understanding. In other words, I want to say it in several ways, in other words, uh, this development was heavily, uh, was basically a, a, a set of activities where theoretical ideas and experiment interact very closely. So, um, um, of course, I mentioned along the way, uh, you know, for example, after step strand extension, whether it breaks or not. So let's let's just uh, let me try to uh, set the stage for the theoretical discussion by saying that uh, from chapter let's just form let me just formally do a little bit of a review. Uh, so if you like uh, the chapter one to five were just all kind of a preparation, right? They are not. They are not the real content of nonlinear, uh, nonlinear polymerology. The nonlinear polymerology really starts, which I mainly were doing uh, in terms of phenomenology. Really start from chapter six on wall slip. It's such a uh, example. There, I just want to say that is there. We learned what do we mean by disentanglement, honestly. It's such a, uh, relatively straightforward place to talk about it because, because the surface really, uh, brings a lot of, break the symmetry and uh, break the, in fact, a fancy word would be it breaks the degeneracy. Degeneracy means uh, everywhere being the same. Every layer is the same. Well, because you introduce the surface, not everywhere is the same. The place near the surface is rather different. Okay? And it is such an important example, both in terms of the molecular picture and in terms of the notion of uh, understanding what disentanglement could produce in terms of its rheological consequence. Uh, wall slip is a great uh, place to start, right? We not only learn how Disentanglement and disengagement could take place with the red chain pulling out of the bulk chain. We, of course, have not said very much about the condition under which this can happen. But let's assume, uh, certainly under the condition of uh, Wi larger than one, that this could, to, could take place. And then, uh, what's so crucial about this 
is really the fact uh, instead of the polymer attending zero velocity there, it actually attended a velocity of Vs, even though the surface has a velocity of zero at the bottom. So, so that, if that happens, then we know how to de describe its uh, influence on the velocity field. And that's the extrapolation lens. Since we just went through some of that concept today, you can really appreciate what a foundational issue this wall slip is, right? It's the same notion that uh, conceivably uh, could be uh, uh, pertinent for bulk deformation, for bulk shear, right? The notion, the notation is the same. The notion is the same. And the associated physics is the same, disentanglement. It's really, really uh, um, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's no question that this wall slip is a uh, central topic. We spend a lot of time on it. So, uh, the rest is uh, all, if you like to think about it. Let me summarize. Let me try to review the rest in, in a, a very clear way. Right. Uh, so this was uh, providing some uh, beginning concept of what, uh, disentanglement and eventually providing you a very, very important notion about how to uh, characterize uh, inhomogeneous shear. And as you know, it also was the way to argue about whether inhomogeneous shear is possible or not. It's all, it's all this ratio, B over H, right? So, 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 uh, so definitely you need to be very comfortable with, with what B is. And then what B is, of course, is uh, uh, more or less fairly clear if I write in this generic form. So it's, it's whatever that disentanglement produces a totally different state of viscosity, if you like, in steady state sense, at least. And it obviously involves a molecular scale of disentanglement, which we tend to think that is on the order of the entanglement spacing. So the rest, you can be really quantitative. And that's just the remarkable thing of what sleep. It's such a simple, uh, set of considerations. Really, really simple. So that's really uh, why we're talking so much about wall slip at the beginning. Really, really useful. The rest, you know, I, it's the same thing. I, I, I can repeat this. I mean, you, you, you are given a book, 500 pages, uh, at the end of the course, that 500 pages should all reduce to one page. Uh, 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 one page, of course, doesn't take more than one lecture to do. So, so I just want to achieve that effect right now. We have went through 20 lectures. It really um, is one page, what's left. What is the, the rest, I can summarize for you, is centered around disentanglement, actually, still. Uh, it's no longer unfamiliar, right? You're, it's not something you're unfamiliar with. The red disengaging with the blue chains here is what we call disentanglement. Chapter 16 will discuss why this is possible and why what we see as disentanglement is... Uh, is uh, something not uh, designed to be addressed in the tube model, in some sense. I, 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 I may be offending people, but I don't think so, actually. 
Uh, it's not designed to deal with disentanglement. So the rest I really want to summarize by saying, as I said, all the phenomenology, there are two parts. Let me not forget the second part. Disentanglement. And we're going to talk about two ways that disentanglement occurs. But that's not all. In fact, a more strike, uh, uh, so you can put it in a different way. I'm going to speak in term, in molecular terms, that's disentanglement. Okay? I can also speak in continuum terms. What is the language in continuum terms that's also striking? By the last few chapters from 6 to, to, to 14. Is I'm going to talk about this is a continuum term, strand localization. I'm going to suggest that this is unfamiliar in conventional biology. including polymer rheology. I'm going to further suggest, oh, you know, there are jokes you can make. This spelled the end of rheology, or end of traditional rheology. Why, what do we mean by all this? We mean the following. Rheology as far as we previously know, uh, is supposed to deal with only prescribed strand field. Of course, you can say uh, that there are times we do creep, but dominantly uh, we do actually uh, this, uh, you know, rate-controlled experiment. So this this is accurate in that sense. It only supposedly deal with deformation that we already know how to control. We can already prescribe it. We already know a priori, so-called a priori. Look how far we have gone. We're supposed to only deal with, let me just be clear, deal with shear from rheometer or from instrument that we know the deformation field is well defined, is, is, is homogeneous, for example. And then, as I indicated to you, all we need is to figure out the stress response. Since your strength field is homogeneous, your stress response is also expected to be homogeneous. In other words, every layer is the same. This is what give me the justification, but of course, last lecture I already motivated for you, uh, because acceleration is so fast, uh, you have uh, every stress is the same anyway. So you can have a transducer just connected to the top surface. The reporting of that shear stress will be that in the internal. You see the point? And that statement is true even if you have shear binding. So that's, that's important to, to point out. But in general, rheology was uh, not supposed to give you surprises, meaning not supposed to deal with surprises. And uh, of course, I don't want to omit the fact you can do creep. Okay? You can do creep, the problem is not different. It's not different in the following sense. If I have creep, in other words, let's do shear creep, which means I already I have a surface I know, I apply certain force, and divide by that surface, I already have the stress applied to it. 
Of course, I don't prescribe where the shear rate will be if I don't know what that material is. But, nevertheless, I know any time I measure V in response to the force I applied, I know that my shear, I know, meaning, I assume the shear was homogeneous. In other words, I know by measuring V, I already know the shear rate in the bulk prevailing everywhere, which is V over H. But of course, that may not be true. We show that to be the case. So I'm just trying to, uh, not to confuse you, that even in the creep mode, we still have the anticipated prescribed field, which is homogeneous. We don't know the value, which is just a matter of measurement. Just like in the first case here, we prescribe the strength field. Of course, we don't know the stress. We measure the stress. But it's all assuming homogeneity. So I think uh, I, I, I carefully spend enough time to say that, uh, that this is unfamiliar. Okay, strength localization is unfamiliar. Uh, it's not something we like to treat, uh, especially in the case of shear. We tend to uh, assume that this doesn't happen. I must, uh, you know, I must indicate in the case of extension. Let's let's be serious. In the case of extension, people of course from know from day one, from long ago. I have my PDMS again from long ago that it do not necessarily undergo homogeneous stretching. It breaks, right? I mentioned about the Winograd-Off group doing that for a long time. Uh, uh, Jim White has done it. There are a number of people who can grab a piece of melt and show why I stretch fast, it breaks. And of course, that's not the traditional rheology we're dealing with, keep in mind. So, Having said that, the last thing I want to comment on is connect between this continuum picture and this molecular picture. And the way you connect, of course, is to ask, gee, what is the origin of the strand localization? And by now, you must have a earful from me saying, oh, the molecular origin, the Right? The continuum phenomenon has a molecular uh, 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 account or, or origin, and that origin is disentanglement, right? Now, there are two more things I have to address. This is not a double arrow. In other words, disentanglement does not necessarily mean you have strand localization. I emphasized this many, many times already. You can have uh, uh, yielding disentanglement, but you don't have to have uh, you don't have to have uh, necessarily inhomogeneity, strand localization. So this, of course, reminded me that I should never forget to add one more item called yielding in this total discussion of the phenomenology of nonlinear polymer rheology. Yielding sits, well, let me do it here. Yielding is a concept that sits sort of in between these two topics. Because typically it occurs Prior to uh, this localization, uh, uh, this, uh, prior to strand localization, right? Because uh, so that allows me to speak about the origin of uh, strand localization. It's a structural breakdown that occurs in a localized manner. The breakdown is yielding, and the origin of yielding is disentanglement, right? And this concept of yield is, is uh, very concretely uh, capturing the essence of the nonlinear response of polymers. 
OK, so since we are going to talk about theory, uh, after reviewing all these three points, the last point that I uh, summarize and focus is really the matter of uh, uh, disentanglement. So after chapter 6, all we uh, did from chapter 7 to uh, chapter 15, all the way to the present, is to speak about disentanglement, or not. For example, the chapter 14 about finite cohesion is a case where the sample does not disentangle. We, we addressed the, the, the existence of finite cohesion is the fact that this untangled state is robust. Unless you smash it, it will resist uh, uh, being destroyed. And that's why you have finite cohesion. So aside from that, chapter 14 talking about uh, entanglement and cohesion, the rest is all about decohesion or disentanglement. And there, in your mind, uh, it should, it, it sh you should only you only need to uh, uh, think about that we did two things. Chaitanya, if you if you uh, what, what would be uh, if you're categorizing two classes, how would you want to do it about disentanglement or about what we have learned so far? If there are only two items that will, uh, to which you can group all we did into two sets of of physics or of features, what would be the two? No, so the slip is just providing some background now. Now. Uh, let, let's assume you have never have to deal with slip. Everything is uh, uh, is without slip now. You have both shear and extension. What, what will be the two? Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, if you uh, if you look at the structure of the book. There is part two and there is part three. So what's different between part two and part three? You want me to read the titles? You don't have it with you. Let me read the titles. Part two says yielding slash nonlinear responses to ongoing deformation. That's part two. Part three. Now you see what so what so how you would categorize it? That's right. That's it. That's it. So part three is decohesion and elastic yielding after large deformation. So that's it. The rest. So let, let me write it down. Start off. Step strand. That's all. That's all. You see, this whole book is reduces to a couple of lines now. And the rest you may be busy in your head is because in each case, we talk about shear versus extension. That's all. In each case, we talk about shear and extension. That's all. And as I said, as I said, this is part three. Sorry, this is part two. And this is part three. Oh, Lord. Part three. And you all will remember that, uh, that, uh, you know, just as an item, that the, the, the chapter seven, uh, give you a summary 
of both shear and extension. And then, see this is where you, you always run out of space. And, and then, uh, if you, yeah, if you like to think about your, yeah, you can do it that way. If you want to think about your, uh, let, let's just not, uh, go, since you should be, well, you, you could recall everything. Then, in the step strand case, there was chapter 12, we spent a lot of time on step strand for shear. And then 13 was step strand on extension. Okay? And then, uh, this, Six as uh, seven. Seven. Chapter seven was merely talking about everything. What can you remember? Seven. Talk about focusing on yield, focusing on startup, of course. It's all uh, uh, what, what is the right word to use? Well, it's, it's focusing on yield, and, and therefore it's focusing on all, on, uh, all, all uh, in the case where the deformation was still homogeneous, was still uniform deformation. And uh, if you like, chapter 8 was also only talking about uniform deformation. It was about strength hardening. Okay? It was, it, it, that was a difficult chapter. That's where I was talking about geometrical condensation. Right? I was talking about uh, uh, chain folds onto the surface back and forth, the Q. I was talking about Think about the density. Think geometric condensation is captured there. And that's all done, discussed, of course, in the limit of homogeneous deformation. So you see, chapter 7 and 8 all deal with homogeneous, just deal with homogeneous deformation. And then, uh, we were sufficiently inspired with all this discussion of yielding, that, of course, the history was the reverse. We discovered the phenomena in chapter 9 discussed the shear bending was foundational. It was that feature of observing sample being homogeneously sheared and then start to break up. And that allowed us to speak about the concept of yielding. But when you write a book, you can do it in a, in a logical way. So, so nine is trying to offer you the idea of localized yielding. Because chapter six, uh, seven already talked about uh, yielding, uh, without talking about this, uh, without talking about uh, localized yielding. Chapter seven was talking about yielding, and keep in mind, chapter nine is a continuation of discussing yielding in the sense the so-called strength hardening was just a reflection of the system's inability to fully yield, such that you have still geometric condensation effect. In other words, the system is only partially uh, non-affine deforming. You still have a fine deformation part. So this is why um, the, the chapters are organized that way. I, I don't think I wasted any words uh, explaining that in the book. But this is how that uh, we deal with the phenomenology of yielding, which itself uh, uh, evidently can occur homogeneously. And uh, it occurs 
not only a shear, but also an extension. But when you have some difficulty resist, or when the system resists yielding, such as long chain branching in low density polyethylene, it resists yielding. And that's when, when you do stretching, you have your response uh, very different than, than linear chains. Uh, I think, you know, people can go back to chapter 8 to talk, to, 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 to review that part. It's a very important part about how we think, uh, uh, strength hardening, quote unquote, uh, came about because people had the wrong reference frame. The zero rate frame is a wrong reference frame because the extensional deformation is a peculiar deformation where the loading area is keep changing. And that necessarily introduces a fundamental difference from shear. There's no geometric condensation in shear. Okay, so you can see that chapter 10 continued on the spirit of localized yielding in more complex geometries, you know, the entry flow, but largely localized shear yielding. So largely it's a shear problem. So chapter 9 and 10 largely talk about uh, how things localizes involving dominantly shear. And then the rest you know, the 11 is our way to start to ask the question of extensional yielding and whether that yielding could uh, be uh, carried out homogeneously or not. And there, there, there are some very strong contentions about our position that untangled melts when you stretch in this limit it will it will not be able to attain steady flow state. That's in chapter eleven. The rest uh, is done. Then, then, then we move down to uh, part three, talk about that. Remember, this first part, when I say yielding, I mean the molecular picture being a disentanglement, right? And then we have talked a lot of it. We talked about conditions when shear binding would not occur, again, related to B over H, right? Oops, B over H. Oh, Lord. That's surprising. Why it doesn't? No, no, it's surprising. I, I tried to undo it, didn't do it. Well, in any case, so, uh, I talked a lot of uh, details about when shear binding occurs or not. And then we move on to extension and showed why it, uh, uh, have no chance the horse race will take place. So the sample will we will maximize that part and sample just fall apart because because all the loading elements are in series. They are not in parallel, they are in series. So they must by definition uh uh shear the same uh, by definition uh have the same tensile force everywhere. So when you weaken that part it will just further stretch. And then part three was uh, a was uh, really, as I told you guys, this is where the discovery, the discovery is most unique. Non-quiescent relaxation, non, that's, that, that notion doesn't exist before, before our discovery. And it has everything to do with the sample elastically breaking apart. In the scenario of shear, of course, 
And, in, and, and because it's a millimeter, nobody was aware such thing could occur. Nobody was aware such thing could occur. Uh, whereas in extension, I, I swear, even today, the extension, you stretch and hold. I swear even today, if you ask me, I would say, gee, the literature must have seen it first. Why before us? Uh, the open literature, we couldn't find it. And remember, this was presented as a prediction. Right? Because we first saw it in shear. This so-called elastic yielding. That, of course, need to be localized if it is to produce motion. Right? And again, whether it produces motion or not, depend on this. I argued that also. You see, it's all, it's just keep repeating the same thing. But the questions are, of course, essential. In other words, when do you have it? We're not asking why do you have it, at least we ask when do you have it. That part is trivial. You see, you don't even need to know why to know this part. You see the point? The detail of it. So, uh, so yeah, the, so this localized uh, uh, failure through disentanglement or localized yielding uh, first observed to occur in shear. I, I even indicated how it was perceived. I mean, how we were led to the lab to do it because it were, I, I was analyzing the existing data. The existing data makes no sense unless the sample breaks apart. Because you're losing too much stress during stress relaxation. And that could only be possible if your sample breaks apart. That's the fastest way to, for the stress to relax. And then, Lo and behold, the same were occurring extension as a prediction. And it pre you know, I presented it as a prediction, and we indeed carried out experiment uh, with anticipation or proposed that way to do. I, uh, uh, so that uh, brings us to up to date. And the only thing left was, uh, uh, was the finite cohesion in chapter 14 that uh, we will say more about in the theoretical discussions. And chapter 15 that we covered today and uh, last time a little bit is a precursor. It, it basically uh, threw you a few more examples uh, uh, for you to appreciate the theoretical implications of what we have observed that the non-monoticity uh, is not quite uh, that simple explanation. And the, the nature of the shear binding it remains mysterious. It seems to be just a transient feature. System gets locked up to that state. And yeah, the rest is really we uh, next time come back and, and really uh, armed with all this phenomenology. It, 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 it should make it easy for me to present, or you know, you guys should be more eager to see what's going on theoretically. As I emphasized, much of what we have gone through so far were carried out as predictions, actually. As I emphasized, the, you can read the papers, you can read the literature, the, our understanding, which has not changed very much since 2007, summer of two, sorry, I must misspoke. Since the summer of 2006, our understanding has not changed. Has not greatly improved, except for the part I mentioned briefly about the male rupture, where I showed some simulation results. Uh, our understanding has not uh, progressed further from 2006. Uh, and you see, ma man, most of the paper were published after that from our group. We have probably something around 50 papers on the subject, and over 40 of them are published after 
the understand, theoretical understanding has already been acquired, which is summarized in the 2007. We will go through all that, 2007 JCP. Um, um, I should not omit to mention that it's only us who have not progressed any further from summer 2006. But uh, our uh, dear friend and colleague, Ken Schweizer, has uh, 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 has been building a theory to, to at least phenomenologically account for what happens. Uh, uh, that part actually is not a focus of chapter seven, 16, however. Uh, we will just talk, cover our conceptual understanding of this and a little bit of scaling. So that uh, we will do next time. Let's see. I can just...